This is Burlington, and here we are in the Channel 17 newsroom. And I am Margaret Harrington with the ongoing Nuclear Free Future conversation. And I want to welcome our guest, Arnie Gunderson from Fairwinds Energy Education. Welcome back, Arnie. Hi, thanks for having me. I'm glad I'm back. Oh, I'm glad you're here. And we have chosen for our topic today, lessons not learned from the Fukushima Daiichi disaster, I'm, I want to say. I want to say disaster, but we, we have chosen the Fukushima Daiichi accident. So, uh, Arnie, could you explain to me the difference between uh, an accident and a, a disaster in this case? Yeah, the, you know, if we're sitting here and a meteor comes through and crashes into the table, um, that's a disaster, but it's, it's not man-made. I mean, we didn't know it was coming. Um, it's just a, a fluke of nature. Um, but the, the, the earthquake and tsunami at, um, at Fukushima were not, uh, were not that. There's a long, long history going back for 2,000 years of tsunamis of that size. This, this thing was uh, 65 feet tall. Mm -hmm. And they had at least three of them in, in relatively recent history. So the, the Japanese knew that a tsunami 65 feet tall, and, and even some have hit 90 feet tall, um, could hit that site, and in fact, relatively frequently did. So that was number one, they knew it. And two, they didn't want to spend the money to prevent it from happening. They could have built this plant higher up with a stronger wall, and it would have prevented the accident. <clears throat> but instead, they wanted to save perhaps a couple billion dollars. And, um, and when the wave hit, it, um, it destroyed um, a monumental structure. So yeah, this was not a disaster. This was not unpredicted. Mm -hmm. Japanese scientists have been predicting this for 30, 40 years. Viewers, I forgot to tell you that you can call in today. We are a live show, and please call 802-862-3966. And Arnie, when you're saying that uh, they could have, they actually could have prevented it, and our subject is lessons that we that not learned yet. So w w this is an ongoing problem, an existing problem, all over the world, a worldwide problem. Yeah, there's a, uh, you know, we we build these plants to be economical compared to alternatives. And w as soon as money enters into the equation, then safety is off the table. So we build the plants to withstand the worst that we think can be, could happen. But in fact, what, what Fukushima showed us and, and two other accidents I'll talk to you about in a minute have shown us is that Mother Nature is um, capable of throwing things at us that we didn't anticipate. Um, in the last year, um, we had the Fukushima Daiichi accident, um, huge tidal wave. But we also had um, the flooding on the Missouri River that completely surrounded a nuclear plant. And, um, and, and it's been shut down now for two years as a result. Had one more thing happened, had an upstream dam failed, we would have had an accident like Fukushima Daiichi in the middle of America. Um, another one was this earthquake that we felt here in Burlington, but the, the earthquake down in um, Virginia. Um, that one uh, was a Richter 6, and the plant was designed for a Richter 6. And the industry will say, well, of, isn't that great? We withstood what we were designed for. But the, that's not the lesson to be learned from, from the North Anna earthquake. The, the lesson is that we thought a Richter 6 would happen once in 20,000 years. And in fact, it happened 30 years after we built the plant. So that, I think that's a warning from Mother Nature that, that if, if she wants, she can throw something at us that we didn't design for. And um, it's a real concern. But are you saying that the plants could be, just be built higher and uh, millions of dollars more be, be put into their construction? Is that what would solve the problem? Or is it that uh, they shouldn't be built at all on these sites? What I'm saying is that if they were built to withstand the, the worst that Mother Nature could uh, throw at us, um, they, they couldn't be built because you couldn't afford to make the plant that strong. These plants are, are uh, the, the safety is um, safety margins are minimized because um, if if they made them as strong as they really need to be, they couldn't compete with with solar or wind or or um, natural gas, for instance. So um, uh, you know, if, if given enough money, 
uh, engineers could build a bridge from from Maine over to England. But the, the question is, the money that's available to keep these plants economical means that safety margins are getting trimmed. And now the, uh, there's a new chief for the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and uh, her concerns, can you refresh my memory uh, on what her name is? That, that she has, her main concern is the plant safety yeah, now. Yeah. There, there's a, just in the last two, um, uh, two weeks, a, a new chairman of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission was appointed by Congress. Um, the old chairman, Chairman Yasko, was hated by the nuclear industry. And the nuclear industry really controls Congress. So he was, um, he left. And uh, a new chairperson was put in charge of uh, a woman uh, who is a, her name is Allison McFarlane. And uh, she is a PhD uh, geologist. And in the article that's in the New York Times today, um, she talks about just what you and I were talking about right now, that the seismic safety margins are not adequate on a lot of these older nuclear plants. You know, back in 1960, when these plants were, were designed, we knew one thing about how the Earth reacts. But now, we're 50 years later, and, and we've learned a lot more. So the question is, can, um, uh, can we take what we've learned and change these plants? The industry said, no, we had a deal. You know, like for my Yankee, we had our license in 72. Whatever we knew in 72 is all we're allowed to meet. And what McFarland is saying is, no, that's not, that's not safe. Uh, as we learn more about the Earth and seismic events and, and other things, we need to upgrade our safety standards and make these plants more robust. Are you saying, Arnie, that the Nuclear Regulatory Commission gave the 20-year extension to Vermont Yankee according to 1972 standards? Yes. Okay, well that's shocking, and uh, let's all wake up people who are watching this, that, uh, th that so much more has been learned for in the, the 40 years, and uh, still yeah. they, they gave the approval. So, so please call in 802-862-3966. We have Arnie Gunderson here, the Chief Engineer for Fairwinds en Energy Education. You know, on, on your point there about the, the, the standard, yeah, Vermont Yankee was built to 1972 standards, and the NRC just relicensed it to those same standards on the theory that if you have a 1972 car, you can continue to, to meet the standards. You don't have to add br extra brakes or extra seat belts or, or whatever. If it was licensed in 72, it can be driven on the roads today. The, the problem with that argument is that Vermont Yankee changed its internals dramatically when they got this power increase. And the NRC allowed them to increase the power, but didn't require them to meet new standards. So they had it both ways. They got the, the best of both worlds. They got the old standards and the new power. And um, that's sort of a, a typical way that the, the commission runs. Uh, it's a ratchet that, um, that only turns one way. And when you tell a, a, a utility like uh, Vermont Yankee to, uh, that, that they have to build to a newer standard, they say, whoa, we were, they call it grandfathered. We were grandfathered in. So these are the lessons that we have not learned worldwide from, from the... Uh, well, that's, uh, that's one, and I'm glad to see that the New York Times is talking about, um, you know, Chair um, um, McFarland saying, we need to look again at the, at the seismic issue. Um, the, the biggest one that's right on our doorstep is, this, is the nuclear fuel. That's stored up on top of these um, of these buildings, like like Vermont Yankee. There's 23 Mark One reactors. That's the kind that blew up at Fukushima. Um, but there's 23 of them in the United States, almost the identical design. And at the very top, in that box that sits up in the air, at the very top of that is the nuclear fuel pool. And we've got so much nuclear fuel in those pools that it it equals the equivalent of more than all of the bombs that were dropped in all of the above ground testing. 700 nuclear bombs blew up. There's more cesium in the fuel pool in Vermont Yankee than in all those above ground tests over 30 years. And we tolerate it. There's a solution. There's a solution. You can take it and put it on the ground in something called dry casks. But Vermont Yankee and the other 23 utilities don't want to spend the money and um, are keeping that fuel in a very precarious place. Viewers, we're going to take our first call. 
No, no. Okay. No, we don't have a call. Okay. I'm sorry. Well, Arnie, you were on a point, a jaw-dropping point, and I'm sorry that I, I deflected the interest away from, from that right now about all of the, the fuel, the fuel uh, supply. Yeah. And what is, what is in that fuel supply for people who are, are not... Well, the nuclear reactor's got the hottest nuclear fuel, but after four years it burns out and it has to be removed, and it's put next to the reactor in a deep blue swimming pool huge swimming pool and um, it has to stay cooled for um, five years and it has to be protected by the water for 30 years. Um, so th there's a solution though. It doesn't have to stay up on the roof called dry cast storage. The, the fuel can be taken out and put into canisters and then lowered to the ground and set on the ground. For, uh, uh, Fukushima had those and Fukushima um, those survived the tsunami and the earthquake just fine, but the building didn't. So the, the lesson that we haven't learned from Fukushima is to get that fuel out of the fuel pool at Vermont Yankee and at 23 other nuclear sites around the country, get it on the ground where it'd be much safer. Okay. Thank you, Arnie. Now we're going to take the call on here. Okay. You're on the air. Hello. Oh. Uh, my name is Greg from Burlington, and my question is, well, wasn't the Yucca Mountain storage facility in Nevada that the, the taxpayer spent billions of dollars building supposed to take care of the storage problems? And why is it now that Nevada is being allowed to say that after we brought all those jobs and spent all that money that they don't want the fuel now? Okay. Yeah, uh, Greg, was your name? Yep. Hey, nice. Thank you for calling. Um, yeah, Yucca Mountain was, um, um, was the chosen site. Um, but not by scientists, by Congress. Uh, Yucca Mountain was called uh, uh, the bill that went, uh, went through Congress to establish the Yucca Mountain site was called the Screw Nevada Act. And basically, 49 states didn't want it. Nevada didn't have much of a population and very little clout in Congress. And so they gave it to Nevada in the Screw Nevada Act. Yucca Mountain wasn't cited scientifically. It was cited politically. Um, so now, after 20 years of drilling and, and, and problems with the mountain, um, uh, the one, the congressional delegation, delegation in Nevada, includes a guy named Harry Reid who, who, um, who, who runs Congress. But two, the science of Yucca Mountain is showing that, in fact, it's not as seismically stable as people hoped. And there's water in the rock that nobody ever accounted for. So for 20 years, we've been investigating Yucca Mountain on the Screw Nevada bill um, because nobody else wanted it, but not because it was scientifically best. Uh, and on top of that, there were the political pressures from, from Senator Harry Reid. Um, so when um, President Obama was elected, he said, no, we're going to choose a site scientifically. And if it happens to be Yucca Mountain, that's good. We'll, we'll, we'll go there. But if it happens to be New Hampshire with its granite or portions of Vermont with its granite, if that's the best place for it, that's where we're going to put it. So um, they've changed the, uh, the approach to finding a place, the one that's not a political decision, let's screw, let, let's screw Nevada, to one that's a, a scientific decision, let's go out and find the best place for it. Are you still on the line, uh, Greg? Along the line, just listening to Arnie. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, Arnie, uh, what about the, se the seismic conditions at, at Yucca Mountain? And uh, how, what are the standards for the seismic conditions today compared to when the, the idea for Yucca Mountain was conceived? Well, as they start at the borings in, in Yucca Mountain, um, they discovered fractures under the rock that they hadn't anticipated. And actually, about 10 years ago, they actually had a severe earthquake that they had never imagined Yucca Mountain could, would, would have. So the, the data indicated that um, um, it wasn't as seismically stable. But the other thing is the mountain was wet. And you'd think something in the middle of Nevada is not going to be wet. But there was moisture in the rocks that would degrade, degrade the, um, the canisters that store the nuclear fuel and allow it to get into the groundwater table. So the government came up with this plan to put um, a titanium cap over these, um, uh, over these fuel bundles, but not until 100 years from now. 
And no one had figured out how to build this titanium cap, but they estimated it would be about $10 billion 100 years from now to go back in and fit these things back up as, as people were, re, were moving out of the mountain and sealing it forever. So there was a lot of technology that was on the come. You know, they had no idea how they were uh, going to walk away from this, this site. Um, now there is a, a, a repository in um, New Mexico that's storing um, that 2,000 feet below, um, uh, below grade, uh, that's storing some weapons waste. Uh, and a matter of fact, in the Times article that you talked about with um, Commissioner uh, Chairman, um, Chairperson uh, McFarland, she does talk about the fact that there have been sites that have successfully stored nuclear waste. She doesn't think Yucca Mountain is one of them. As a matter of fact, she was a critic of Yucca Mountain before she became the chair of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. So um, is there a site somewhere in the United States that can store the waste? Likely, but is it Yucca Mountain? Not likely. Now, Arnie, you were talking about the fuel supply on the top of the nuclear power reactor, yeah. right? And now we're talking about the nuclear waste, which is a totally different thing. That right. I'm, re I'm correct, right? That's right. But they both have the same, they're both made up of the same thing, actually. Well, they're both connected. That the, the, at the top of the reactor in that pool is the waste that ultimately has to go into the ground. There's, there's no place to, um, uh, to store it um, above ground because it lasts for something on the order of a quarter of a million years. So um, we can't build a structure above ground. And the theory is that you could find a place that's geologically stable enough and you could put it underground until it decayed away. And that process takes about a quarter of a million years. But it's the same material. It's just new compared to you know, potentially very, very old when it gets into the ground. And where does depleted uranium come into that? Ah, well depleted uranium um, is what's, um, uranium in the earth that we mine is 99% uranium-238 and a little less than 1% uranium-235. You need the 1% to run a nuclear reactor. You don't need the 99%. So they strip out that 1% and they run nuclear power plants with that 1%, but then they still have all this other uranium, 238. That's called depleted uranium because it's been, the 235 has been removed. That's used in weapons. Um, it's, not, um, it's not a nuclear bomb. Um, what it is, it's a metal. Uranium is a metal and it's, um, it's pyrophoric. And what that means is that on the M1 tank, for instance, the projectile on the M1 tank doesn't have any explosive in it. It's a, uranium, a depleted uranium casting. And when it hits another tank, the friction of the shell is enough to ignite the uranium. Um, the, you know, the, the engineers like it because there's no explosive involved. But the problem is that when it volatilizes, when it burns, it releases atomic size molecules of uranium that get in the soldiers' lungs. Mm -hmm. And so we're seeing now a lot of, um, of illness and birth defects in the children of our soldiers that have been in um, Iraq and, and uh, uh, you know, the, the first war, the first Gulf War under, under the first Bush and the, the second Gulf War and now Afghanistan. And it's because we're using depleted uranium projectiles that when they vaporize, uh, give off um, very small particles that wind up um, being inhaled and then getting stuck in your lungs and ultimately in your liver and other organs. Arnie, is it true that in order to get depleted uranium, you need to have nuclear power plants? Or nuclear weapons, Or yeah. nuclear weapons. You need a process to separate out the 235 from the 238. Mm -hmm. um, we use it here in Vermont. Um, the, the Gatling gun on the, um, on the A-10 Warthog airplane um, had um, depleted uranium um, bullets. And um, that Gatling gun was tested on the National Guard Army range up against Mount Mansfield. Uh, so um, the, the testing of depleted uranium weapons has occurred right here in Vermont. 
Arnie, all of this is alarming, and uh, we, we have a, a time limit here on our live program, but so I'd like you to touch upon uh, the other lessons that we have not worldwide learned from the Fukushima Daiichi accident. Okay. Well, the, the, the first one was the, um, the fact that Mother Nature can and will throw things at us that if we have anticipated, we didn't want to spend the money to prevent. Um, and that's a, that's a broad picture for any of the nuclear power plants, even the new ones. You know, the new ones uh, being built down in, in uh, Georgia, for instance, are designed for a Richter 6. Well, if there's a 6-5, they won't stand up. So we've convinced ourselves that the worst that's going to happen in Georgia is a Richter 6, and therefore they're okay. I don't think that's the, the lesson we should take from Fukushima. If we think a 6 can happen, we better design for a 7 because the odds are something can happen that's worse. So that was, the, I think that's item number one. Um, and the, the other item is the, the fuel pool issue where um, uh, the utilities to save money are storing 40, 35 years of, of spent nuclear fuel in, uh, in locations that are nowhere near as safe as they could be. And everybody knows this. This isn't new technology that has to be developed. The canisters that hold this waste are available and readily available on the market. But nobody wants to spend the money to get the fuel out of those pools and onto the ground. Um, the industry will say, well, we're concerned about our worker exposure. But, but that's a straw man. In fact, over 20 years, the industry has sped up refueling outages. And in the process of speeding up the refueling outages, the workers have become more exposed. Well, the industry has never said, well, we got to slow down and not make as much money. Uh, instead, they've given those workers that worker exposure. Now, when it comes to taking the fuel out, they're suddenly worried about the worker exposure. In fact, it's a straw man to try to save some money. Unfortunately, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission has bought that argument. The other issues are, um, uh, I've, I've said it before, uh, sooner or later in any foolproof system, the fools are going to exceed the proofs. Um, we had that, we had that at, at, at Fukushima Daiichi, where um, the components that were designed to work with electricity suddenly didn't have electricity. Um, so we didn't have, uh, so then they had to send men down to turn huge valves of over a hundred times to open a valve. And in, in the process, they couldn't do it because uh, it was hot, it was radioactive, there were aftershocks, and it was awfully radioactive to begin with. The net effect of all that was that the foolproof systems weren't foolproof and the buildings blew themselves to smithereens. Um, so there's a lot of lessons that, um, unfortunately, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission isn't learning. And, and the time is running out, isn't it? I mean, between one accident and the next accident, we, we have no way of knowing how much time we have. Well, if you listen to the experts, um, they'll say the chance of an accident is one in a million. And if you've got 400 nuclear power plants worldwide, you put a million on the numerator and 400 on the bottom, that means there should be one accident every 20, 250 years. That's what the, the nuclear establishment will say. That's what their numbers show. That's what their, what we call probabilistic risk assessment shows. So if you go by their numbers, we should have one accident every, um, every 250 years. In fact, we've had five accidents in 30 years. We've had Three Mile Island, Chernobyl, and Fukushima Daiichi 1, 2, and 3. So we've had five meltdowns in 30 years. Instead of listening to what the nuclear people will say is one accident every 250 years. Well, it seems that the uh, the numbers are so abstract, but the the people involved, the people who were evacuated so so uh, badly from the Fukushima area, are are living testimonies to what the disaster really was. And yeah. uh, today I saw that they have found uh, uh, butterflies there in that, in that area that are, are mutants and are uh, very strange. They, they describe them as very strange looking butterflies. So we see that this is working upon the, uh, the, the birth cycles mm -hmm. of, uh, of uh, our species. So you know, th that's a great point. Th there's, um, there, there's some good science out about rapid mutations in insects. 
and insects are relatively radiation resistant compared to human beings. So, uh, uh, yeah, it, it is frightening. And then, of course, if it's in the human gene pool, it will be, you know, uh, two or three generations before it completely manifests itself. The butterflies already have a couple generations and already it's starting to manifest itself. So we won't see the, the results on the human gene pool for you know, 30 or 60 or 90 years until this, uh, this works its way through. You're right, it's an abstract number and they want your eyes to glaze over and, and say, well, this is so remote, I don't care about it. But in fact, it, it's, it's a very real, um, you know, terrible consequence. And for our viewers, too, you, you mentioned that there are new nuclear power plants that are, are actually being built in Georgia. And these were approved to be built after the, uh, the accident in Fukushima in March 2011. Well, and that's interesting. There's four new nuclear plants being built in the United States. Um, two at the Vogel plant, two at the VC Summer plant. Um, and uh, if Wall Street had its way, they wouldn't be built. But you and I are, are um, on the hook for, for the cost of those units. We've signed uh, a loan agreement so that if they default, um, Vermonters have to pay for that plant down in, down in Georgia. And it's interesting because I, I testified down in Georgia about it. I didn't think the plant was safe. And one of these guys from Georgia said, well, you're, you're a Yankee. Why the heck should we listen to you? You know, this is a Georgia plant. Leave us alone. I said, you're right. You're exactly right. I want my loan guarantee back, and you can have that plant. But no, they don't want it that way. They want it so that they get our money for the loan guarantee, but yet the, the safety issues, uh, they're really not willing to hear us Yankees tell them about. Arnie, uh, we're winding down in time now, and I just want to put us into the time frame that we are in right now. This is the, uh, the 67th anniversary of the bombing of Hiroshima, August 6th. And in some states, like in, in Vermont and in Connecticut, it is observed as Nuclear Disarmament Day, as, as to, uh, to face up to the past, the present, and the future. And people are taking responsibility. And viewers, we can take responsibility by learning from, from Arnie, a, a, an engineer expert on, in the nuclear field. And awareness is very, very important. And, but what else, Arnie, are, are the important things for, for people who who are not in the field and, and, uh, and want to learn more about it. Well, I, I go back to Tokyo for 10 days next week. And um, one of the things I'll be telling the people in Japan is that um, this, uh, this can be bookends. You can have the, the beginning of the nuclear era started with Nagasaki and Hiroshima. The end of the nuclear era can be Fukushima Daiichi. And then it can bracket the, uh, the nuclear era if we allow it to. There are alternatives that are cheaper and safer, um, and we just need the political will to, um, uh, to um, go up against a machine that's, uh, that's well-funded and that is influencing our Congress, and it's not in our best interest. Yeah, and it, it's, it's hair-raising about uh, the, uh, the influence of con on Congress of the lobbying and the corporations, and uh, this, is, this is a major problem that uh, really people weren't aware of back at the beginning of the nuclear age, which is going, is going on to 70 years now. Well, so. Vermont's Peter Bradford, who lives down in Peru, has said, there are no Democrats and Republicans when it comes to nuclear power. There are only pro-nuclear people. Essentially, Congress has been totally co-opted, with the exception of, of Bernie Sanders and um, um, Ed Markey in, in Massachusetts and a few others, Dennis Kucinich. Um, just a few congressmen and senators have the courage to fight this lobby, but almost all of them have been co-opted by the money and uh, are pro-nuclear. Thank you, Arnie. We're, we're winding down now. And viewers, thank you very much for, for, uh, for being with us today. I hope that you learned a lot, as I did, with, with Arnie's uh, conversation here. And until the next time, as we uh, go into a nuclear-free future, may we be more well-informed. May, may we be uh, aware. And thank you very much, Arnie. Thank you for having me. Goodbye for now.